Good evening and welcome to another episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Christina Hagen, coming to you live from Cape Town. We had a lovely day here today, although I see not everyone in South Africa was so lucky. The messages coming in from the rest of the country saying it's been very cold. So I hope everyone is wrapped up warm and, and safe. Tonight, we are joined by Associate Professor Arjun Amar, who will be sharing his fascinating use of uh, Google image search to gain insights into raptor evolutionary ecology. But before I introduce him, please remember that you, our audience, can communicate with us using the Zoom chat room and questions for our speaker can be posted into the Q&A box throughout the webinar. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, you can use the comment feed for your comments and questions, and I'll get to them at the end of the webinar. If you would like to get in touch via our social media channels, please use the hashtag Conservation Conversations. All of our previous episodes are available on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel and our podcast. We'd like to ask you all to please subscribe to our YouTube channel and help us grow support for our video content. A couple of weeks ago, we managed to hit our 1000 subscriber threshold. So thank you very much for helping us to get to this milestone. If you are enjoying our webinar series and can afford to support it financially, every little bit helps to every little bit helps us to keep this webinar free for all to learn and enjoy. You can simply scan the Cricut QR code on the screen or visit the Conservation Conversations website to find the link in the donations tab. And we'd like to say a big thank you to everyone who's donated thus far. So the big news from the month for BirdLife South Africa was that we successfully hosted the Virtual African Bird Fair. We had over 1,800 people from across Africa and the world joining in for what is truly the biggest event in African birding. If you were unfortunate enough to miss out, the content is still available on our platform for only three more days. So please head over to eventmobi.com slash birdfair and you can watch all of the wonderful presentations. If you enjoy these weekly webinars, then the Bird Fair was an absolute feast of entertaining and informative presentations. Now we only have fewer than 80 tickets left for our jackpot birding raffle, so make sure you don't miss out on this opportunity to support conservation while standing a pretty good chance of winning 100,000 rand. Head over to birdlife.org.za slash jackpot birding and I'll post a link to that in the chat uh, shortly. And our Conservation League donor competition is ending at the end of the month so you can show your commitment to conservation by signing up and standing a chance of winning a four-night stay for two at Zimanga Private Game Reserve in northern Kwazulu Natal valued at 40,000 rand. For, for more information, please email membership at birdlife.org.za. And now uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Arjun Amar to our conservation, conservation, conservation Conversations webinar series. Uh, Arjun is an avian conservation biologist with a focus on raptor conservation. He completed his PhD in 2001, examining the cause of the dramatic decline of hen harriers on the Orkney Islands in Scotland. He then worked for the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. Arjun has also worked for six years as a senior conservation scientist for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds in the UK before joining the Fitzpatrick Institute at UCT in 2011. Arjun's research interests lie in, undertaking, in understanding the processes that regulate avian distributions, demography and population dynamics and applying this understanding to the conservation biology of declining populations. He's particularly interested in understanding the mechanisms that drive these declines and identifying appropriate remedial, remedial management to reverse or prevent these trends. So I'm very interested to see Arjun's presentation this evening where he'll be sharing uh, an, quite a novel use of technology to, uh, to highlight um, evolutionary trends of raptors. So Arjun, uh, over to you. Thanks very much indeed. So thanks Christina for introducing me and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you all today. 
Um, so yeah, as Christina just described, actually, I am really a conservation biologist at heart. And uh, so this is this work that I'm, that I'm going to talk about today is slightly to one side uh, for my main research area and my main the work that my research group mainly focuses on. But it's something that I'm uh, quite passionate about and uh, I've, I've really enjoyed working on. And so this is using web sourced photographs for, for ornithological research. Um, and as you can see uh, from the long list of people down at the bottom there, this is work I've been doing with, with lots of other people, um, particularly uh, a bunch of students here at the University of Cape Town, honours students and master students, but also uh, academics uh, in the United States and, and in Europe. So uh, just to outline the structure of the talk that I'm going to give today, uh, first of all, I'm going to uh, introduce the origins of the idea. Um, where I came up with, with this idea and where it stems from. And then I'm going to talk to you about uh, this uh, specific paper, which is where we assess the viability of the method. So, uh, and it resulted in, in this paper that was published in Methods in Ecology and Evolution, and also led to the development of uh, the, a web application called Morphic, uh, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about. And then I'm going to talk to you about uh, how we then uh, applied and expanded this approach uh, working on questions linked to the evolutionary ecology of plumage coloration uh, and more recently um, and patterns and more recently uh, to ecological and conservation questions, uh, specifically using this approach to uh, investigate the diet of, of a couple of raptor species. So before I kick off, um, I would like to introduce you to two uh, relatively basic concepts that many of you might be quite familiar with, but it's important to, to have these outlined, first of all. So first of all, I'd like to talk about colour polymorphism. So colour polymorphism in its simplest form is where you have the co-occurrence of two colour morphs in the same population and where they're not linked to age or sex. So here's an example of a, a colour polymorphic species, the black species. Uh, which I'll talk to you about later. Um, and so here we have, it's the same species, but they look um, starkly different from each other. Uh, and so they're not two different sex. We've got a light morph on the left and a dark morph on the right. Um, and so this is the idea of, uh, of a color polymorphism. And the second concept I'd like to introduce you to is the idea of clinal variation. And that's where you have a gradual change in the morph ratios across the distributional range of a species. So um, here we have uh, an example of clinal variation. This is actually uh, the black sparrow hawk again across South Africa. So each one of these circles represents a population of black sparrow hawks and the size of the pie that's colored in dark represents the proportion of the population that's dark morphs. And as you can see uh, here in Cape Town, we have lots of dark morphs in the population. But as you move uh, eastwards and northwards through the range of the species, the proportion of dark morphs in the population declines. And what I want you to recognize though for here is that that is very hard won data. So that data is actually quite difficult to, to get hold of. You have to go out in the field, you have to observe those individuals and you have to make note of their, of their morphs. Um, and so when people actually look for clinal variation of polymorphic species, they often find it, but it's very difficult data to extract, particularly at large spatial scales. But understanding the spatial patterns of uh, morph distributions can be really useful because it can allow you to understand the environmental factors which might be involved in driving those distributions and therefore ultimately the factors involved in maintaining color polymorphisms of a species. And in this example here we linked the uh, distributions of the morph to the light level in the environment during the breeding season and you can see that the proportion of dark morphs in the population is far higher where it's uh, you have low light levels and then as light levels increase you get a reduced proportion of the population that were dark morphs and we we're only able to do that analysis because we went out in and collected that data on the morph ratio distributions across through the population's distributional range. So first off, I pose the questions, what is currently the main use of Google images for ornithologists? Well, for me at least, because I'm such an absolutely hopeless bird photographer, it was always to steal photos of my study species for talks, uh, PowerPoint talks. 
And I was engaged in that very nefarious activity one time, searching for black sparrowhawks on Google Images. And it occurred to me, perhaps there's more than just the photo here. There's more information than just the actual picture of the bird itself. And the reason for that is, is because if you click on one of these images, it takes you to a web page associated with that photo. So let's just do that in this instance. So we click on this, uh, this photo and there it takes us to this website. And there's some key bits of information, uh, lots of your other useful information potentially associated with that photo. So for example, it tells you the species and also the morph type. So in this instance, a black sparrowhawk and it's a dark morph. It'll often give you the date the photo was taken. And most, uh, most importantly, from the perspective of, of the most of the research that I'm going to talk about today, it also gives you a location. So in this instance, the Helderberg Nature Reserve. And you can put that into Google Earth and you can get a fairly accurate location associated with that image. So that made me think perhaps we could use Google Images to build up spatial data sets of visible phenotype of things that we can see in the photos themselves. For example, the morph of those, ind of those individuals. And at the time I was working on uh, a black sparrowhawk morphs. And that's the reason why I thought, well, actually, if we're able to get this information using uh, Google Images, then it could speed up the, the process of trying to understand what factors might be associated with the distributions of morphs in the environment. But to test that, we needed to explore whether the data that was generated using Google Images was actually valid and viable data, because you can think of a whole host of different reasons why it might not be. It could be wrong, the wrong species label. It could be uh, the photos could be, could be misidentified. Um, there's all kinds of hosts of different reasons why the data you got from the internet might not match with the data, more rigorous data that you got from the field. So to test this approach, we searched for existing data sets with n of known morph distributions. So data where people had gone out and collected that data really rigorously in the field. And then we sought to compare the data collected from these intensive approaches with the same data collected using Google Images. And this uh, is the paper that, that uh, resulted from that work. This was uh, work that Gabrielle Layton led on, um, and she did this for her honours project. And I was delighted that she was awarded the 2016 Robert May Prize for this, this paper. So I'm going to go through three case studies that we used in that paper. Um, the first one is not a bird at all. It is about black bear morphs distribution across Western North America. I have to admit, when we started this, I actually didn't even realize that uh, black bears were color polymorphic, but they are. You get brown ones, you get cream ones, uh, and then you get the normal black morph as well. So in 1987, uh, Rounds published this paper in the Journal of Biogeography, where he collected data on the morph ratios uh, across the whole of the Western North America. So we did exactly the same thing. He took several years to collect these data. And we wanted to look at whether or not the locational data that he got, the proportion of dark morphs in the population that he collected using fieldwork was matched when we did it using Google Images. As I say, this took rounds many, many years. And then Gabby Layton uh, extracted this data for her honors project. It just took her a few days. And this is the relationship that we found. So this is the proportion of dark morphs in different locations found by rounds using his the fieldwork. And this data here on the uh, x-axis is the data that we found using Google Images. This red line here would be the one-to-one -one ratio. So that would be if it perfectly matched what rounds found. And you can see this dotted line uh, is the trend line put through all these dots. And you can see it's an incredibly good relationship. So that suggests that the data that rounds collected using intensive field work was matched very well. In fact, as our R square of 0.8, as excellent agreement between data collected using Google Images and the data collected by rounds. The next case study that we uh, applied this to was uh, barn owls across the globe. So barn owls are cosmopolitanly distributed species. They occur all around, around the world, as many of you know, and they're also polymorphic. So you get very pale individuals and then you also kind of get russety red individuals. Now, Alexander Rulen from the University of Lausanne in Switzerland has been studying these, this species for decades now, over 20 years of work. He's traveled all around the globe and he goes to the different museums in different countries and he records on a scale of one to eight, 
how uh, red or pale the, the barn owls are. And he provided uh, us with his data uh, for the, um, the different scores, the average score of a country around the world. And then we went and sought the same data um, using Google Images. And again, you can see this is that relationship, a very tight relationship. So in places where he scored very relatively high scores for barn owls, we also scored for those same countries very to be high. And likewise, low scoring sites also receive low scoring sites using our approach. So our data was matching very closely this data that Alexander Rulen had collected over two decades of work. And the, la the last example I'll give you in terms of validating this approach was actually is a little bit different. It comes back to the work we did on black sparrowhawks. So this is work that Gareth Tate did uh, with, for his PhD. Um, and again, this shows you that that same uh, map was showing the distribution of the morphs uh, across Southern Africa, South Africa rather. And the key thing here is that we find this clinal variation. What we wanted to know was whether we could find, we would find the same clinal variation if we used Google Images. So if we hadn't gone out and collected all this field data. And this is the relationship. So here is all the blue dots are all the dark birds and the red dots are the uh, light birds. And this line here shows the relationship as you move away from Cape Town in terms of the proportion of dark birds collected from field work. And the red line is what you would get if you just use Google Images. And the key thing to note here is if we hadn't got that data on um, uh, the morph ratios across the landscape in South Africa from field work, we would have still detected this clinal variation using Google Images. So as you move away from Cape Town, the proportion of photos that are out there on the web of dark birds decreases and the proportion of light birds increases. So uh, this work um, led to the development of the Morphic web app. So we teamed up with Pierre Hugo from the Department of Computer Sciences at the U University of Cape Town to develop this uh, application called Morphic. So it's available free to use at uh, morphs.io. Um, and what it does is it allows you to uh, create um, a search, a customized search for whatever a topic you're interested in doing. It goes into Google Images, it scrapes the web, it caches those images. Um, it then allows you to create this uh, customizable survey. So this is the example survey for uh, the black bear work. You can hear, you can see as a checkbox for adults, uh, ages, adults, juveniles, the morphs, the sex, the photographer's name, the subspecies. And what really speeds things up is it allows you to, once you click on the website associated with the photo, you can type in the location and it will give you a grid coordinate. And then once you've done all that, uh, it deletes the duplicates and it allows you to export the data to Excel ready to analyze that data. Uh, Gabby's produced this fantastic YouTube video that talks you through that process if it's something you're interested in, in exploring. Okay, so the first step then to, uh, of this work was step one was validating the method. And that's the stuff I've told you about so far. So I would say that we did a good job of that. Uh, we're able to show that Using this approach, we were able to generate uh, robust data that matched with known morph distributions from more rigorous methods. And next, we wanted to generate new data to test specific hypotheses that we're interested in. So this is the first application that we, the, the first uh, application where we applied this method to generate a new data set. And it's for this species called the Swainson's hawk. So the Swainson's hawk is a polymorphic uh, buteo species. So it's a type of buzzard um, that occurs and breeds in North America. So uh, you can see this is the same, same species and this is a, a standard morph, a light morph. This is the intermediate morph in the middle. And then this is the dark morph here. And it had long been suspected that this species um, showed clinal variation. Um, and it was thought that there was more dark morphs in the West than in the East. But I was quite surprised to find out that that was never been empirically tested. So I'd read quite a few papers about Swainson's hawks and all that work uh, assumed that this clinal vari variation existed, but it was just based on anecdotes rather than any actual empirical data. So I thought this would be quite a neat species to apply morphic to, to find out whether or not this suspicion was right. But also I wanted to uh, explore the morph uh, uh, variation in relation to climate variables. And the reason why I wanted to do that was because of the finding that we had from black sparrowhawks. 
So as I said to before, black sparrow hawks show this cladal variation, and it's uh, strongly associated with solar radiation. And this is hypothesized to be driven by the idea that in areas where you get less sunlight, where it's duller, you get better crypsis, you're better camouflaged if you're a dark morph bird. Whereas in places that are brighter during the breeding season, uh, like in the east and the, and, the, and the northern areas of South Africa, the, the, the light morph has uh, better camouflage. So that was the, the hypothesis that we put forward for the explanation why we had this pattern for black sparrows. And I wanted to see whether this same pattern existed for um, uh, swains and sorks. I wanted to see how general this pattern was, whether it held for other raptors or whether it was just unique to black sparrow hawks in South Africa. So I wanted to find out whether other polymorphic raptors like the swains and hawks also showed this same spatial pattern. So we set up Morphic. This is that same uh, um, image of, of the web application that I showed you for the, the black bears, but for Swainson's hawks. Um, and this is the paper that, that we published on this work, if you're interested in it. This was published in 2019 in the Biological Journal of the Linnaean Society. And so this is the Swainson's hawk. It's a migratory BTO, and this shows the distributional range of the species. Um, here in green is where it breeds in the in North America, in America, uh, USA and, and Canada. And then it moves down through Central and South America down to the Pampas region in Argentina where it uh, overwinters. So it's quite a good species because you know that the birds that are on their breeding range are, are photos taken of those birds on the, are, in North America are on their breeding range. And if we uh, if we likely to see adaptation, we expect to see that on the breeding range rather than the wintering range where they're all mixed up together. And we know that from the tracking studies. So um, this shows the uh, photos we obtained using Morphic. We obtained uh, nearly 900 usable images from across the breeding range, the North American breeding range. And when I say usable images, that images uh, that's an image, a photo of the species where we can see that it's a Swainson's hawk, we can see it's an adult Swainson's hawk, and we can detect it's more uh, as well. And you can see that these were distributed across North America. And now I'll show the, the actual distributions of the morphs. Um, so here we can see the black dots here are the dark morphs, the gray dots are the intermediate morphs, and the white dots are the light morphs. And you can just see visually quite clearly that there is very strong evidence for clinal variation. So far more of these black dots here on the west than there are on the east, more of these white dots in the east than there are on the west. And this relationship, uh, this just, the figure just shows that and confirms that clinal variation. So we have longitude here on the x-axis and the probability of finding a dark morph on the y-axis. And as you move eastwards, the proportion of dark morphs goes down from around about 70% of the birds being dark morphs on the west coast of North America down to less than 10% on the eastern region, part of their region. So then we extracted uh, environmental data uh, associated with each of those photo locations. So we extracted remote sensed information on things like solar radiation to test that light level hypothesis, and then also information on rainfall and temperature. Now this shows the relationship uh, between the probability of being a dark morph and those environmental variables. And you don't need to pay huge amounts of attention to this, but basically if these lines overlap zero, that means if these uh, horizontal lines overlap zero, it means that there's not many evidence that there is a, a, an actual relationship with that environmental variable. And so the key thing here to note was that our relationship that we'd found for black sparrow hawks, we did not find for Swainson's hawks. So there was no relationship with solar radiation and the probability of being a dark morph. But we did find significant relation negative relationships with temperature and rainfall. So these are those relationships. So as temperature declines, as it gets cooler, you're more likely to have dark morphs. And as it gets drier, you're more likely to have dark morphs. So in drier, cooler areas, there's more dark morphs in the population. And that provides support for what's known as the thermal mentalism hypothesis. The idea that birds in cooler places are dark because it helps them gain heat. So there was support for, for that, for this species. So the next step we are doing, starting to extend this work now, actually is to explore these patterns for other North American beauties. So 
Here's two photos here of the red-tailed hawk, and then two photos here of two morphs of the ferruginous hawk. So these are other polymorphic uh, butio species that also occur in North America. And we wanna see how general the pattern we found for Swainson's hawk is now for these other butio species. So red-tailed ferruginous hawk, do they show that same negative relationship between rainfall and temperature? So this is work, that I'm, uh, ongoing work, research that I'm doing at the moment with uh, Rebecca Muller and Siobhan Reynolds. Um, and uh, I can share this one graph with you here. This is work that, uh, a map that Siobhan just put together uh, a couple of uh, days ago, actually. We managed to get information on red-tailed hawks. Oh, actually, sorry, I'm gonna go step back a little bit, actually. And I just remembered to mention something here. Well, you see this emblem here in the corner, Macaulay Library. So uh, what we discovered after we'd done the work on Swainson's hawk was that uh, Macaulay Library for certain uh, aspects of this research is a fantastic resource. So Macaulay Library is hosted at Cornell. Um, it's a great uh, website to go onto just for fun actually, um, but it has, it, it hosts photos um, of, uh, from eBird and such like. And for certain species and certain projects, it's proving incredibly useful, even better than using Google Images to extract the information. Um, so for species like red-tailed hawks, uh, Swainson's, Ferruginous, North American species have fantastic records of photos on Macaulay Library. They're already geo-referenced, most of them, and they also have a, a very good date associated with them as well. And so we've actually, uh, for the work on red-tailed and ferruginous, we've actually had a lot of success using Macaulay Library rather than uh, Google Images. And we've extracted for the red-tailed hawks alone nearly 2,000 photos specifically just during the breeding months for uh, uh, this species. Um, and we've scored them uh, from one to 10, uh, but for the purposes of this map, we've just scored them either dark morphs or not dark morphs. And this is plotting them across North America. So these are all the 2000 photos we've got um, distributed across the North American uh, range. And here instantly, again, you can see that we have far more dark morphs in the west of the country than we do the east. And the next step now is to extract those environmental data and to explore whether that same pattern emerges that we saw for um, Swainson sorts, whether that same pattern emerges for, for red tailed hawks. Okay, the next um, example of work that I'd like to talk to you about is work that was just published uh, about three or four weeks ago now um, in Biology Letters. Uh, this is work by Michelle Vretos, who did her work uh, with me uh, for her honors project. And this was exploring the potential adaptive function for the malar stripe in peregrine falcons. So the peregrine falcon, uh, along with many other species of the falcon genus, shows this very distinct malar stripe underneath its eye, you can see here. Uh, and this dark strip of feathers below the eye um, has long been assumed uh, and stated actually as fact to reduce solar, uh, solar glare. So the idea here is you've got peregrine falcon, the fastest uh, bird in, in the world um, and they're hunting very agile prey and the last thing they want is sun reflecting off their cheeks into their eyes so this, this idea of reducing non-information containing light uh, they don't want that reflecting into their eye and so that's the idea that that's what that dark strip is to, is for and that's also the same hypothesis that's been proposed for uh, the cheetah for these uh, teardrop marks underneath their eyes and it's also the reason why North American uh, athletes, so people that play um, lacrosse, uh, American football, baseball, also wear this eye black makeup under their eyes. Um, and so this is the reason, this is the idea that it reduces solar glare into, into your eyes. And this hypothesis has been an, a, a long, around for a long time for peregrine falcons, for the Mela stripe, and it's been in, become ingrained in popular literature. If you read books now and, and, and any book about a bird of prey and, it'll, and, and there's a section on Mela stripe, it will state it as fact that that's what this adaptive function is. And I was actually lecturing to some honours students about this and I was looking for the, for the source material to try and give them as a reference. And I was amazed to find that there's absolutely no research whatsoever exploring that topic. It's just been assumed that that's what it's for. So we thought that this would be quite a good uh, example to try and use our, our approach of using web source photographs to explore whether there was any evidence for that. 
So again, we used information from uh, Cornell's Macaulay Library. Uh, we extracted information, uh, photos from peregrine falcons distributed across the world. Uh, again, fantastic species to work on, a bit like the barn owls, because they're so well distributed across the globe, uh, occurring everywhere apart from Antarctica and New Zealand. Um, so we were able to get photos distributed across the entire global range, nearly 2,200 photos. And then Michelle scored uh, the photos according to different characteristics of the Malar stripe. So she scored, here are the, the four characteristics, the width of the Malar stripe, the contiguity with the hood, the prominence, darkness of the Malar stripe, and the length of the Malar stripe. And then we extracted environmental data associated with each one of those photos. And the idea here is that if this was an adaptive function, if the Malar stripe does serve to reduce solar, solar glare, we would predict that um, peregrine falcons in brighter, sunnier conditions would have wider or more prominent Malar stripes. And these show the results for that relationship, that analysis. This is, uh, again, the same, the same kind of plot I showed before for the four different variables. And I've highlighted here the relationship with solar radiation. And you can see that for three of the four variables, three of the four characteristics, they have a positive relationship between solar radiation and the size or prominence of the Malar stripe, supporting the idea that, that this could well indeed be an adaptive function for uh, reducing solar glare. We also explored it for two, for two other variables, rainfall and temperature, and actually only two of those uh, variables had had any relationship so there was not very much consistency here whereas the consistency lay with solar radiation so this provided support first ever published support for the solar glare hypothesis uh, for this long-standing uh, idea that this is what uh, the malar stripe the function that the malar stripe serves Okay, so, so far I've spoken, the examples I've spoken to you about uh, using this approach is to explore questions uh, around evolutionary ecology of raptors. But we've now begun to use this approach for other types of studies, so related to uh, questions more associated with conservation and ecology. So the first of these was to explore the diet of a threatened raptor, the Marshall Eagle. So this species, uh, as many of you may know, have just been upgraded to uh, endangered uh, due to declines throughout its uh, African range. Um, and we wanted to use, uh, we use, here again, we use the Morphic web app to source photos of this species on prey uh, posted on the, on the web. Um, and it was a good species, a good candidate species to use because it's a very large species. Uh, people take lots of photos. If you see a Marshall Eagle uh, out, if you're driving around Kruger, people will often stop, even when they won't stop to take photos of other birds. They may well stop and take a photo of a, a large charismatic eagle. Uh, and and we're just scanning photos on the web, I, I was able to see that there was a lot of photos of, of the, this species on, on their prey. So I thought it was a good candidate species to try and explore this uh, approach with. And we wanted to uh, use these data to first describe the overall diet of the Marshall Eagle, and secondly, to explore geographic variation uh, of, the, of the species diet across its range. So I wanted to describe the diet of Marshall Eagles. I wanted to explore whether there was any variation geographically in the diet. And the last thing I wanted to do, uh, importantly, was explore whether there was any variation by age. And actually, when you think about that, um, understanding diet of juvenile raptors is actually really, really difficult. Almost all the methods we have to explore diet of raptors are focused and centered at the nest site. So it's either from prey remains or cameras or pellets, that sort of thing. But they're always focused actually at the nest site themselves. So what that means is the diet information tends to be biased towards the breeding birds. And it's very difficult actually to get information on the diet of non-breeding birds to be able to compare whether there are differences in the diet. The only other examples of ways of doing that are through things like stable isotopes of the feathers or some novel techniques more recently where they swab the beaks and the claws and they actually use DNA barcoding, which is an amazing, amazingly cool method to explore the diet. But you can see it's, a, it's a quite a difficult uh, actual topic to get at. 
So this is the, the paper that we published. It was published in Condor again in 2019. And we were lucky enough to get the, the front cover. Uh, not surprisingly, this is an amazing photo of a Marshall Eagle on a, on a monitor lizard. Um, was the front pay, uh, cover that was used in, for the issue of, uh, of, of the journal. Okay, so we were able to get information uh, from using uh, web source photographs from uh, 200, uh, just over 250 prey items from eight uh, countries in South and East Africa. Amazingly, we didn't get uh, virtually any photos at all from any uh, examples from West Africa at all. I mean, this species is relatively rare in many West African countries, but it's interesting that we, we really didn't get any at all from those areas. And we were also able to obtain 16% uh, of those photos came from non-adults. So that was quite important. As I say, we wanted to explore whether diet differs between the different age classes. So first of all, just looking at the overall diet of the species, we found uh, very approximately about a third of the diet was made up of birds, a third made up of mammals and a third made up of reptiles. Birds and mammals were far more diverse, so they comprised of 15 species of birds in the, in that we were able to see and 23 species of mammals, whereas um, reptiles, even though they made up a third of the diet, um, they uh, uh, made up of only three species of which uh, the monitor lizard was um, about 95% of the diet. We were then able to explore that question about how diet varies geographically. So this shows you the information we're able to get. Uh, so the size of the circle represents the, um, the, the number of samples in each country. So Kenya had the most with 79 samples. Um, and then we were able, one of the key things to notice here is the difference in diet between um, Eastern South Africa and Kenya. You can see a far higher proportion of mammals green in East Africa than there was for Eastern South Africa. And the other thing to notice here is that because the sample size was reasonably high in South Africa, we could actually look at the diet difference between Eastern South Africa and Western South Africa. And the key thing to notice here was far more reptiles in the East of South Africa than there was in the diet of the West of South Africa. And the reason why that was uh, important to us to check for was because we actually have prey remain diets um, for marsh eagles in those two areas. And it matches very closely with what we obtained using uh, Morphic to look at diet. So this was a further validation, uh, even if only an informal way of exploring whether the diet data that we got using uh, Morphic and Google Images was similar to the data that was obtained using more intensive approaches. And indeed it was. And actually that's been further backed up now by the comparison of diet with East Africa now. Work that Stratton Hatfield's done has shown that the proportion of mammals is indeed very high, um, in the, at least in the Maasai Mara in Kenya as well. So a further validation of, of this approach. So based on uh, the relative success of using this approach, I'm sorry, I, did, I, I thought I had a slide in there to talking about the diet differences between adults and, and non-adults, but uh, I don't, but we did find differences between the adults and non-adults. And what we found was that uh, juveniles tended to take less birds in the diet than, than adults do. And we think that is perhaps because maybe birds are one of the more agile prey items and maybe it takes a number of years to develop the more specialized hunting techniques to be able to successfully capture birds. So there's a lower proportion of birds in the diets of, of juveniles than of, than, than of adults um, for that, for, for martial eagles. So based on the success of of that paper and of that work on uh, martial eagles. Um, I worked with Connor Panther, who's a, an MSc student at Brighton University, and now a PhD student at the University of Nottingham in the United Kingdom, to look at the diet of Eurasian sparrowhawks. And so the idea here was that um, we were able to explore certain questions with martial eagles, but for a species like the Eurasian sparrowhawk, a very common raptor in the United Kingdom, for example, a species that people encounter very often, for example, uh, in their gardens or in uh, cities even on prey items, um, that we might be able to obtain even more data and be able to explore even more in depthly the diet of, of this species. And so for this, uh, Connor really threw the kitchen sink at this species. Um, he used not only Macaulay, iNaturalist and Google uh, Images using Morphic. He also used a website called uh, Bird Guides uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, he also used Twitter and Facebook. 
Um, so we really did uh, try to get as absolute maximum number of photos as we possibly could of uh, Eurasian sparrow hawks um, on prey items from the United Kingdom. And for those of you that don't know uh, the species, uh, it's very sexually dimorphic, probably the most sexually dimorphic of all raptor species. So the female is around twice the size of, of males, a huge difference in, in size. Um, so we're able to, this shows a map of the United Kingdom and the photos, distribution of the photos of all the different photos that we managed to get of the species on, on prey. Uh, and we obtained uh, nearly uh, 850 photos of uh, prey, of, of this species on prey. So considerably more, almost three times as many, uh, more than three times as many photos that we obtained from Marshall Eagles. Uh, that comprised of nearly 600 photos of adults and nearly 300 photos of juveniles. And the key thing to notice from this table here is where we were getting those photos from. So although I said Macaulay was fantastic for, for example, the Swainson's hawk study um, and the red-tailed hawk study, we actually got very few photos, only 14. So less than 1% uh, of our photos were coming from Macaulay and also very for, small proportion of photos from uh, iNaturalist. Where we got most photos from was actually Morphic and this specific website, Bird Guides, lots of photos from Facebook and then quite a few photos from Twitter. So I, I just throw that up really to show that it really is kind of horses for courses, that not one size doesn't fit all. It really does depend on the question you're asking in terms of the best approach to obtain uh, the, the photos that you want to use. And what we're able to do though here, and I'm not going to talk in huge detail because this is ongoing work, but we were able to get information throughout the whole breeding season, okay? So both during the breeding season, which is kind of here for this species, May, June, July, but also during the non-breeding season. So that's another key uh, um, difference between using this approach and other methods. So we were able to obtain data during the non-breeding season, which is also quite difficult to get information on in terms of the diet. So this study, as far as we know, is one of the few studies where we could look at diet outside of the breeding season and inside of the breeding season, but both also for adults and juveniles and males and females. It's a very, very difficult thing to get at those three different components um, using normal uh, standard methods for looking at raptor diets. So as I said before, the species, uh, and credit again to Connor Panto, I, I really love his figures. He's able to do, make these incredible drawings for, for his figures, which are just fantastic. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, but uh, anyway, this shows the, re the results for that work. Um, this looking at the size differences in prey size. So there's between the sexes, as I said, adults, um, the males and the females are very, very different in size, about twice as big, the females. And you can see that's reflected in the prey size here. So this, these little triangles here show the average prey weight. You can see that for females, it's around 300 grams, whereas it's only around 100 grams for the males. So it's almost three times the, the prey size consumed by um, females than it is for males. And these are just broken down by the different um, prey sizes, small, medium, and large. And then we can see that the prey size differences, not quite as marked for the juveniles as it is for the um, adults. Um, but we were able to explore these age differences in prey usage for some of the key prey species. So this is um, the results, but I'll just highlight one of the key results, which I think is the most interesting from, from this. So if I just blow this up, this is for rock dogs or feral pigeons. And you can see that if you look at the diet differences for adults, males really don't want to take on these adult, uh, these pigeons at all, presumably because they're too big for them, uh, whereas the females take a lot of them. Whereas if you look at the juveniles, the males are often seen on these prey items. So one of our interpretations of this result is actually that the juveniles, the males are still figuring things out and they are actually tackling prey that probably isn't suitable for them. Um, and they learn that by the time they become adults not to bother attempting to take those uh, very large prey items. That's our interpretation. And the other thing we're working on at the moment is exploring how diet difference, differences varies um, during the breeding and the non-breeding season to explore some of these hypotheses for um, this re reverse sexual size dimorphism that this species um, exhibits. Uh, and hopefully uh, watch this space and we should get some more results on that very soon. Okay, so where next? Well, I guess it's... Um, 
first of all, I'd like to say that this uh, approach has kind of taken off. There's lots of people using this approach now, and it's even been recently termed eye ecology in a, in a recent uh, tree paper. Um, and the new research topics that uh, I can see on the horizon or work that's actually currently other people are undertaking now um, and that I've been involved in and, and helped guide um, work on plumage or abnormalities. For example, uh, this study, which was very cool, looking at factors associated with leucism in the common blackbird and exploring whether or not um, urbanization led to increased levels of, of genetic mutations for these this species. Uh, a, species, uh, a study that's just very recently been published, um, we're looking at these uh, digital images to uh, explore molting patterns. And this is something that uh, Jenny Gill uh, um, voiced the desire to do years ago when I first spoke to her. She wanted to use it for her godwits. Um, and so I can see a lot more people using this approach for that kind of questions. Um, there's an idea of using uh, these, this approach to look at migration range, particularly for subspecies where they're identifiable visually. So here's a woodland kingfisher, two subspecies, and you can see they have a different eye mark on their eye. So you could actually use the photos taken in different places to explore whether migration ranges of different subspecies different, differs. Um, there's the idea of using this to explore interactions. So somebody uh, cleverly used this already to explore the different species that oxpeckers exploit. Uh, here you can see one on a, on a zebra and you can look at the different uh, mammal species that they, they exploit. And I've been really pleased to see uh, diet studies increasing. So this paper was just published uh, a, few, a few months ago as well, uh, looking at um, another raptor species, the tiny hawk, and using exactly the same approach as us to, to look at the diet and whether or not it, this species is indeed a specialist predator on hummingbirds, which it turns out to be that it isn't, um, although it was, it was supposed to be. So that's the sort of research that's going on. And every time I speak to people that work on different fields, they all come up with new ideas. Uh, and so I still think this is a, a very ripe area for research. And we're working on lots of different topics ourselves at the moment as well. So these are the, the key papers I've spoken about today, if any of you are interested in those. And uh, yeah, thanks very much indeed for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Arjun. That was, that was fascinating. Um, really, really interesting work. Um, let me just start sharing my screen again. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of citizen science, um, and so this is a, a great use of people's photos without them kind of actively having to participate in a, in a, um, in a citizen science project, so you can reach, um, you can use data from, from more people. Um, That's right. And although I, I'm fascinated and I love the kind of evolutionary ecology side of it, I'm also glad that you've kind of highlighted some sort of, of the more conservation applications, which is, is um, key with, with the biodiversity crisis that we're going through at the moment. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, before we get on to, to some questions, um, just if, you, if anyone does still have a question, please uh, pop that into the Q&A box or into the Facebook uh, live comments. And then I'd also like to remind everyone to please uh, participate in the post webinar survey, which will pop up uh, when you exit the webinar. It will, it'll only take you about two minutes to fill out. And then uh, next week, uh, the webinar is all about uh, sunbirds and uh, pollination with uh, Dr. Anina Kutsia. So please join us for that. So now, Arjun, I'm on to some questions. Uh, I think the first one from Penny Abbott uh, kind of goes to a basic assumption of, of the studies um, and that is that the photographers that people are, are equally likely to take photos of birds of the different morphs as well as on different types of prey. I assume you, you have considered that. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, so let's just take the, the different morphs, first of all. That's the absolute reason why uh, in fact, that's a perfect example, better than the examples I was given, why you could imagine this might not work. 
And that's the reason why we published the very first paper that we published was that methods in ecology and evolution paper. Because mm. we wanted to establish whether or not we, whether it was a valid technique or whether these biases of perhaps people, you know, much preferring to take uh, for more, way more photos of the obscure morph uh, and that obscured any uh, likely relationship. And, and, and what we found was that wasn't the case. So, you know, that the, the, the there was uh, that the data that you collected from very rigorous field work was matched very, very closely with the data that was obtained um, using Morphic. And I guess this links to some degree to uh, the idea of citizen science data. So a lot of people say, well, citizen science data um, is never going to be as rigorous and as good quality as if we go and we pay professional scientists to go and collect those data. And then other people say, well, yeah, but you can never afford to do that. What you've got is citizen scientists collecting these data and the mass of data and the amount of data, this idea of big data, would swamp any of the weaknesses that might come about because these citizen scientists might not be quite as well trained as the best professional out there. And it's the same thing here, really, is that we wanted to explore whether the amount of data we got was good enough and of reasonable quality that it matched the more intensive data and that's absolutely what we found and every time we check for it we find that it does reflect the field data so that methods in ecology one explored the distributions of the different morphs and then the diet studies that we've, we're getting now as well uh, when we try and match that with field data seems to be very very closely matched as well so hopefully that answers that. Um, and I guess the, the one of, of, of birds of, of, on different prey items. Yeah, again, you know, if, if they're on an obscure prey item, would someone be more likely to take that photo? I think, to be honest with you, when someone sees, when people see a martial eagle and on a, they take a photo of it because it's a martial eagle and yeah. uh, it's on prey even better. And, you know, to be honest with you, I haven't, I've, I've spent quite a lot of time in the field with martial eagles and you don't get to see that many on prey items. So when you see one on a prey item, you take a photo of it. Um, and I think it's probably the same with with uh, the sparrow hawks as well. People, people, you know, when they see a, a bird of prey on a prey item, they take a photo. Of it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and then I guess a similar kind of, well, a question in a similar vein is um, from Alan Bedford Shaw, are there any concerns about the data um, with photographers' misidentification of species? Um, he says, I guess that uh, Cornell's database might be a bit more helpful um, in that people do check them, but um, kind of just anything posted on Google, are you relying on, on the photographer themselves making a correct ID? Yeah, so, so the way it works, just to be clear, and then often people get confused by this, is that it's for the morphic, it's quite a lot of, it's it, even with the morphs uh, the, uh, web application, we still have to do the legwork. So all that mm. does is it just, help, it just helps us process them. But it's still a photo that we need to look at, check that it's the right species, and then record the information for. And so, in fact, we were, we were looking, um, the work that I talked about, Michelle Vretos did for her honours, she's now expanded that out to look at the malar stripe of all falcon species. And in fact, we were on uh, looking at photos today of tighter falcons, and because we, we haven't got very many of those photos, so we're trying to explore ways of getting more photos of tighter falcons. And, and one of those was, a, was clearly a peregrine falcon. So, you know, we, we're the people that have to put that checks and balance just because someone says, look at this martial eagle on a, on a, on a prey item and, and then it's an African hawk eagle. We have to be, be, be checking those photos. So it isn't that it's an automated process. And likewise for you, but you're right, that the, the question is right, that in uh, Macaulay, um, it is even better. You see less mistakes. You still see the odd mistake though, um, but, but we're there making sure that, that we check that, 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 that those mistakes haven't crept in. Yeah, that's great. Um, then Jesslina Suri asks about the peregrine work, um, whether there's actually a way to measure the solar glare and how much or how big a difference the stripes make. Um, it's, it's amazing that it seems to cause such big variation in the birds. Yeah, so there is a, a study that used um, plumage uh, I, I, I can't quite remember how they did it, actually. I think they had a camera um, in the eye of uh, bird skins and then they reflected it off, that, off the birds to show that it does reduce um, the solar glare um, it, in terms of the, the patterning around the, around the face. 
Um, so, so yeah, so people have done that and it does indeed appear to be the case that it, that it does reduce solar glare. But I know a lot of people often, I can kind of understand why people, where people come from from that, because you kind of think, well, does that much sunlight come from your cheek? You know, I've yeah. never noticed myself looking at my cheek really but 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 it only needs to be a, a small amount for it to reduce um and all it has to have is a, a a small consequence and reduce the the odd pigeon that it doesn't catch and that's enough for evolution to do its work so clearly it looks like it is mm. and then uh, <clears throat> steve davis asks about the the marshall eagle work and um, whether you have any ideas on the why there's that difference between the proportion of birds and mammals um in the in the different locations yeah um i think cleverer people than me will probably have better <laughs> ideas really uh, but I, I mean when you think about where the marshals are uh, in the west and, and the east you know in kruger there are lots of um uh water monitors and and they seem to be the main prey item and there's you know lots of rivers running through and and you can see that whereas in the east um you know you don't you don't have much uh riverbeds in in mm. the east of the country in the Karoo um and maybe that's the reason why there's less uh, reptiles featuring in the diet because there's not monitors in the same way as there are in the in the in the east of the country that would be my my guess I yeah Okay, thanks. Um, and then Jan Rademacher asks, uh, well, he's firstly says great presentation and absolutely interesting work, um, and asks about uh, looking at trends over time. Um, is that something that's kind of built into the, the morphs thing or, or is that something you have to, you would then do kind of separately? So, no, it's a good question. It depends what he means. So a lot of people have, have said, OK, so going forward, um, could this approach be used to look at trends over time in the future? And I think it, it probably it probably can, uh, because I think what we'll see is and I think we've already are beginning to see it, is the far more photos going up online now than there was five years ago or 10 years ago. You know, everybody has a phone with a reasonable camera on it. Um, there's, there's, you know, there's more uh, people more in the habit of, of loading up their photos um, and these sort of things. So I think um, more people have got digital cameras. So, it, so in certain places in certain countries where there's lots and lots of photos, I think we could use it to explore certain trends over time. If the question, however, means can you use uh, date now to look at trends? over time. I'm not sure whether there's enough photos uh, over the last 10 years, you know, per year. Um, we are, however, for that Sparrowhawk work, using it to look at um, changes in time over a year. So looking at breeding season, non-breeding season. And the other work that I spoke about, you, looking at the Buteo morph distributions in North America, we're actually re restricting photos to only include during the breeding season. So we align the environmental data specifically with the conditions they experience during the breeding season. So we are using time as a component, but in terms of looking at it for trends now, no, but in the future, yes i think i think it's possible for certain questions so for example if we see a morph invade an area we could use uh, we could probably use this approach to describe that or a change in the distribution patterns of subspecies for example as they ebb and flow with climate change for example i suspect we can use this approach yeah okay great um oh then christoph uh who's a regular a listener um says not a question but a tip about two sites that you may use in the future so um you can i'm not sure if you know of those already birdpicks.nl and observation.org so potentially yeah, no there are there's a lot of these um uh, country specific um uh, it's very similar to that bird guides actually and when we first started doing that sparrowhawk work the eurasian sparrowhawk we want to actually explore diet in the same way as we did for the marshall eagle but across uh, Europe and the different countries to speak, see if diet varied um, and actually we weren't able to get anywhere near as many photos from these other countries and I think that's because each uh, country seems to have one of these mm. uh, sites like there's the birdpicks.netherlands ones in the same way as we have the bird guides in the UK as well so yeah there, there are a lot of those kind of uh, 
sources out there that are worth tapping into. Yeah, definitely. And as you say, people are, are increasingly posting more and more photos um, online. So I, as you say, uh, every time you give a presentation, people come up with new, new ideas. So it's going to be fascinating to see what, what you do in future with this and, and what other people uh, do um, using your, your methods. So we've, we've come to the end of the questions in, in the Q&A box. Um, and I don't see any others popping up. There are lots of positive comments in the chat box. So I think everyone really enjoyed that. Thank you very much again. Um, so I think we will leave it there. Um, I'll just give you a chance to say any last words if you'd like to, and then I will uh, leave the, the, the room open for a little bit in case anyone wants to put any more chat, uh, comments in the chat. Um, but yes, thank you very much. Do you have any last comments? No, no, that's great. I'm, uh, I'm pleased everybody enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for very much for listening. Thanks for inviting me. Great. Well, it was, it was a pleasure to have you present to us and really fascinating work. Thank you very much. And uh, to our audience, thank you very much for joining in again this week. And uh, please do join us next week. Good night. <laughs>